Hello everyone, welcome to uh, Science Sunday. We have a special guest speaker today. Um, we're both fully uh, vaccinated, so we can, uh, we can be together in small groups. And two is about as small as you can get for a group. That's right. right? Um, we're here uh, for Science Sunday, and Mike Werner, some of you may recognize Mike Werner. Uh, some of you may recognize his name. Some of you may recognize his voice and his face. Um, he was a longtime member here at the DuPage Unitarian Universalist Church, and he's a co-founder of our humanist group. And this uh, Science Sunday is one of the programs that is um, co-sponsored by the local humanist group. Um, we've had grants from the American Humanist Association that have helped us get some of our uh, AV equipment that we use when we're in the other room. And uh, in any case, Mike, is a longtime Unitarian. You've written some books about Unitarian Universalism. Um, you've also written about humanism, and you're a champion of, of humanism. You've served as, I think you were the president of the American Humanist Association for a while, a co-founder of our local humanist group, and an avid science and philosophy buff. So um, without further ado, my friends, I would like you all to welcome back to our wonderful home here in DuPage, Mike Werner, my friend and colleague. Thank you so much, Scott. It is really great <clears throat> and an honor to be back here at the DuPage Unitarian Church, where I was a member and my wife was a member for 20 years. Uh, in fact, I saw the crib downstairs in the basement. That is the same crib that we put our son, who was less than a year old when we first moved here. He's now 34, and uh, we're helping him move into a new house up here. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll be back here a lot more, but we're helping him move into a new house. I'm really glad to be here for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is this church has always been a bastion of humanism. In fact, Gene Creaves, when he founded this church, it was a humanist chapter of the American Humanist Association before it became a member of the Unitarian Universalist Association. It's always had a strong humanist component here. I'm gonna be talking today about evolutionary psychology, and it's particularly interesting to me uh, to speak on it. I'm not an expert, but I'm an avid, artic, uh, avid uh, uh, person to advocate for it, understanding it, because I think it impacts everything we say or do in philosophy, psychology, f uh, sociology, anthropology, all of the, the uh, liberal arts, as well as philosophy and uh, uh, politics as well. I'm here to tell you that it turned my life over when I first found about, out about it. It was, it was revolutionary to me. It was an epiphany, like a religious epiphany. It's like, my God, how did I not know this and see it? I subscribe to what's called the standard sociological model, that all we are is our culture, and that can be uh, uh, infinitely uh, changed, etc. And then to find out that not only do we have a biological nature, but it impinges on everything we do. It was a total revelation and really uh, gives a great lens to everything I see in my life. As I mentioned, I'm not an expert on it. So, uh, and I will tell you this, that it's also controversial in some ways, outside of evolutionary psychology and also within it, because it's a new discipline. It's a brand new dis discipline, and we can expect uh, changes, etc., until it comes about. But I will also say this, that almost all fields of intellectual endeavor have been played out today. There's so many people, so much time, and the only way any field grows is by bringing in new ideas from the outside. And evolutionary psychology is one of those areas. The 20th century was the age of physics. And the 21st century, as many people feel, is the area, uh, era of biology. William James, the first psychologist, said over a century ago, a great many people think they're thinking, when they're really just merely rearranging their prejudices. And that's what we're talking about. What are the sub subconscious motivations? The things that are impinging on what we're thinking. Are we really thinking or just rearranging our prejudices? I'm gonna give you an example here. This is from uh, 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 the whole science of, uh, 
uh, uh, morality and ethics. And it's called a trolley car problem. It was originally developed by Philippa Foote, a philosopher. And it, the idea here is the analogy is uh, there's a, a trolley car and it loses its brakes. It's got a bunch of people on it, but you can't stop it. It can't stop at all. But at the bottom of the hill, there's five people on the track, five innocent people. And what we're going to do see is that trolley car has to, uh, is going to have, has no control over itself. And those five innocent people are going to be killed. But you are a bystander with a switch. And you can switch that trolley car to a spur line where there's only one innocent person. So you have to make a decision. Am I going to kill five people? Or am I going to flip the switch and only kill one innocent person? So I'm going to ask everybody out there in Cyberland, raise your hand if you think you should just let the trolley car continue unabated and kill those five innocent people. Or should you flip the switch to the spur line and kill only one innocent person? Can't, so, I, can't I put a penny on the track and derail the trolley no, car? No, no, the way these, these, these trolley car problems are uh, designed to, to present moral dilemmas in which you have no choice. Oh, no. That's, yes, yes. Yeah. There's no out. There's no out on the trolley car problems. And by the way, I have over, uh, uh, people collect stamps, I collect trolley car problems. There's over 200 of these. Wow, okay. <laughs> so, and all of them are moral dilemmas you can't get away from. So, out there, Who's going to let it go straight? And who's going to flip the switch killing to one person? And I see some people out there in Cyberland and raising their hands both ways. A rather murderous group out there today, it looks like. But let's switch it up now. Let's say the five innocent people are still there on the track. But let's say on that spur track, the one innocent person is a loved one. It's a son, a daughter, a spouse a mother, a father, someone very close to you that you love. Now, let's take the poll again. How many are willing to let the track continue and kill the five people? And how many people out there in Cyberland are willing to kill a loved one to save those five people? Only one person. I think you can see, regardless how you chose, you feel conflicted. And that's what we're gonna be talking about with evolutionary psychology. We have a comment from online. Um, uh, Greg says that uh, considering the trolley car problem has become, uh, I'm paraphrasing, an operational programming issue for self-driving cars. So now exactly. cars are having to make these sorts of decisions. Exactly, yeah. exactly. They actually are making that. And they have ethicists, teams of ethicists, trying to decide that. Now here's Charles Darwin. In 1859, of course, he wrote his Origin of Species which again was a revolutionary idea, an epiphany for most people to change their whole thinking of our origins, where we came from, what our, where we're going, etc. Who are we as human beings? And he said this, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one most adaptable to change. But he's also said, in a distant future, Psychology will be based on a new foundation, that of necessary according to each mental power by capacity, by gradation. He was, he was uh, foreseeing the advent of evolutionary psychology over 100 years ago. Now, you know, we evolved over a long period of time, uh, over 4 billion years of evolution, probably 40 million years of primate evolution, but about 70 years, 70 million years ago, or 70, I'm sorry, 70,000 years ago, <clears throat> which is just an instant in evolutionary time, we went through the big uh, bottleneck. And the big bottleneck was when the whole population of the Earth descended dramatically. We don't know if it was climate change or disease or whatever, but the population, they understand, got down between 500 and 10,000 individuals. That's why human beings are so evolutionarily similar. But just think about this. Just 40,000 years ago, there were, all, there were five different species of human beings on this earth not just the Australopithecus, uh, or the Neanderthal man, I'm sorry. So we've got a short evolutionary history from coming out of Africa 
on the African savanna. Karl Marx was a person, um, and by the way, Karl Marx never had a job. He was sustained by Mar uh, Friedrich Engels, whose father was a, um, a, a British industrialist. That's where he got his money. But he, he had the idea that all history is nothing more than a continuous transformation of human nature. There was no fixed biological nature. Karl Marx was an avid uh, supporter of Darwin, but he didn't feel like it impinged upon who we were as human beings that we had infinite capacity, and especially with regard to selfishness, self-interest, and getting rid of tribalism. Later on, um, uh, Franz Bose, who was considered the founder of anthropology, also subscribed to that concept that we now call the standard sociological model, the blank slate or tabula rasa model. It's the idea that culture makes us all who we are, not biology. And all knowledge comes from experience and perception. There is no fixed human nature. We're, our, uh, who we are as human beings is completely adaptable. But one of his most, his, his most famous students was Margaret Mead. As we know, Margaret Mead went to the South Sea Islands and here are two of the people she talked to, young women, and talked to them about their sexuality. And she came up with the concept that Again, there was no fixed human nature, and that sexuality was completely uh, a cultural phenomena, and uh, believed that these young women about their sexual exploits, etc. Many years later, people uh, investigating talked to these same women, found out that they said, no, no, we were joshing her. We were just going along with what she wanted to hear, with exciting, titillating stories. Huh. So, so, so they fibbed. They fibbed. Huh. They fibbed her, and she had no background on it. And so she believed that there was uh, human sexuality was completely adaptable with no biological basis. Hmm. Later on, Noam Chomsky, who we all know by uh, today because of his uh, 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 political interests, but before that, he was a linguist. He was a modern. He was the first modern linguist. He uh, uh, developed an understanding of over 20 languages, including Navajo language, which many people at that time considered to be untranslatable with no grammar, etc. But he showed that not only it, but all languages at their core have a universal grammar. He called it the universal grammar. And I've got a bunch of his books on that originally. And they're, they're way beyond me. They're totally undecipherable in some cases. But he makes the case that all languages are, are um, a, a portion of what's embedded in our brain, some kind of adaptation in our brain. And that, but he never, by the way, said where he thought that adaptation came from. But it's hardwired into our brain. We could never learn language as fast as children do in any culture uh, because they just, it, 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 you know, the people aren't teaching them. They teach themselves. But the languages are all different. For example, <clears throat> German, for example, uh, has, just like we do, a subject, verb, predicate. But the verb, many times, is at the end of the sentence. But it's still subject, verb, predicate. We sign, we find the same things that we could, frankly, uh, uh, negotiate with different uh, uh, formatting, etc. We see the same thing. Have you have you seen the recent? Uh, I, I, I've seen this going around uh, in a, in a few different places about adjective order. So you right, might right. say um, a large angry brown bear, but you wouldn't say brown angry large bear right, typically. Exactly. There's and by a order. the way, that's universal as well. Right. I was wondering about yeah, that. Yeah, it's universal as well. Yeah. Uh, I, why? Not completely, but you know they see it. Mm -hmm. um, Steven Pinker later on came about and said, well, of course we know where that, that hard wiring came from. It's evolution. Evolution gave us this adaptation as a survival technique. And it's, as he said, humans are so innately wired, hardwired for language that they can no more suppress their ability to learn and use language than they can to suppress the instinct to pull a hand back from a hot surface. In fact, he wrote a book called The Language Instinct, did he not? The Language Instinct was a book that he taught. That, yeah. that was his first book. And by the way, it's a, not just brilliant, it's funny. The guy, it, 
when you meet him in person, he's a real guy. I mean, you know, yeah. he's, just, he's just so real and nice. And especially E.O. Wilson. He's one of the most decent people you mm. could ever meet in your life. Brilliant as well. And went against the grain when he started off. People weren't supposed to be going into, as he said, a natural, as a being a naturalist. He is the number one expert in the world on, on uh, uh, ants. In fact, he wrote a 900-page tome that got the Pulitzer Prize. Now, how do you get a Pulitzer Prize for About writing ants. on a, a boring subject like ants? But he did, as, and won a second one for his second book on sociobiology. Again, he revolutionized the field, though. Sociobiology eventually morphed into what we call today evolutionary psychology. Sociobiology was not welcome, though, because leftists, Marxists, believed that there was uh, no fixed human nature. This went against the grain, and he, he uh, was castigated for that. Also, second-wave feminists didn't like it because he was saying that there was a biological difference between men and women. And that went against the grain. And in fact, in one big lecture <clears throat> at Harvard, one time, a woman came up and took a pitcher of water and poured it over his head, saying he was all wet. Now, Stephen Jay Gould, who was there at the time, came to his defense, saying that that was a horrible thing to do. And he was a Marxist, you know, but he believed that everyone should have their, their uh, say on this. And it, by the way, eventually came around to believe in evolutionary psychology, even though he was a Marxist. So what you're saying is, re referencing back to something you said earlier in your talk about we just rearrange our biases, right? So if exactly. a person has a Marxist biology or... It's uh, ideology. Uh, it's not it, science. Yeah. A lot of these people, a lot of the criticism of Pinker and E.O. Wilson, it's all based on ideology because you believe something and you're not really looking at the science. And as as uh, E.O. Wilson said eventually, Karl Marx was right. Socialism worked. He just had the wrong species. <laughs> in ants, of course, it does work. You know, there is no self-interest, and you know, the tribalism works there and everything else, but it does it with human beings. Stephen Pinker, as I mentioned, then came to his defense and wrote the book The Blank Slate, which is a refutation of the blank slate standard sociological model. So this book is actually arguing against the idea of the blank slate. Right. If, if you haven't read it, you may not recognize that fact from the cover. Right. Yeah. But he, he is arguing that not only do we have a biological nature, but we have both nature and nurture, and inextricably woven together and, and impossible to tease apart. But not just that, but all of those. And he goes to case after case explaining that. Of course, for that, he was, again, roundly criticized by many people because they don't want to hear that. They want to hear that people are infinitely changeable, that we only use 10% of our brain, and things like that, which is not true. Evolutionary psychology has one basic premise. The human behavior and cognition, especially psychology, are governed to a great extent by Darwinian evolution. In other words, evolutionary psychology proposes that genetics is the most important mechanism for understanding and shaping psychology. Evolutionary psychology, again, you know, it shapes our, our, our brain and our, for, because of survival and reproduction. You know, we, have, we say there's a lot of reasons things, things happen, people's behavior. But ultimately, going back, almost all of our behavior, you can, when you study evolutionary psychology, <clears throat> you can see it all going back to those two basic things, survival and reproduction. And the reason? Because if we didn't, we wouldn't be here. Hard, it's hardwiring analogy is many times used. We have these hard wirings in our brain. We have soft core software as well, but we have what we call today instincts, proclivities, drives, desires. There's a lot of words that we can use to, to explain these subconscious drives that are coming out of the old brain, that are inchoate. They don't have a voice, but they are driving us all the time. The evolutionary process is really variation, then in, uh, inheritance, and then selection becomes inheritable success. There's many things that we can learn in um, <clears throat> evolutionary psychology, but just remember that the 
We're, we have Pleistocene Stone Age brains from a four million year uh, uh, evolutionary history. A long pro, uh, we have a long unbroken uh, chain of our ancestors. Think about this, every one of your ancestors survived and reproduced, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You won the lottery, we all won the lottery. People that had a spouse that was, uh, for example, that was sterile, uh, there's somebody, you know, somebody uh, succeeded in, 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 in impregnating them and uh, getting uh, uh, your ancestors. We are close to our, we're, but because of all of this, because it's all subconscious, we're too close to our own brains to un, and our behavior to really see it. Um, evolutionary psychology, though, is a lens to view all human behavior. Oh, yeah. Not all, the only one, but it's certainly an important one that's most of the time missed out on. We have a, um, a sort of a question from online. Is survival identical to reproductive fitness? Uh, no, you need both survival and production. You've got to survive, okay. and you have to be able to survive to have, uh, to, to reproduce, but then also survive so that you can keep that child alive. Uh, <clears throat> there's a, one of the important things that was going along here to get away from the ideology is what's called the mismatch theory. We have hardwired behaviors in our brain, etc., but they're not always useful today in our concrete canyon cities. They were sort of great, they were great uh, adaptations out in the savanna, but remember, we're not that far from the savanna. We haven't had time to evolve. But violence, tribalism, uh, male dominance, polygamy, and by the way, 85% of all societies in history and throughout the world have been polygamous. It's only, marriage is only about a two year, 200 year history, uh, to, to be frank uh, with things. But all the sex differences, etc. yeah, they, they give us problems and everything else, but that's our challenge, so how do we deal with these? Because just because something is natural and evolutionary driven doesn't mean it's right. What is doesn't mean it has to be should. So that's going to be the dilemma we fight. Um, we find uh, consciousness is really a perception that is, is, uh, we're trying to gain about the world. If we didn't have our perception, if we didn't get it right, we don't survive. Uh, brains are naturally evolved uh, information processing organs, and we live by our wits. We're also social creatures. We know that from all the primates are. They're highly social, we talk, and we also have technology to help us as human beings. And scientists, uh, uh, Donald Brown has found over 200 universal cross-cultural, cross-time uh, behaviors in humans. These are hardwired behaviors, over 200 of them. Like baby talk, right? One of my favorites is uh, baby talk. Yeah. The high-pitched yeah. nonsense babble that we do to babies, every culture does that. And you know, it's interesting, uh, there's some very good research out of Yale by um, some researchers there on babies. And babies are pretty selfish little animals mm -hmm. until about two years of old is when they start gaining um, uh, empathy. It's only till about three or four, though, that they start gaining um, uh, compassion. Empathy and compassion are two different things, and they, they've really done a great job on that uh, in, more, in more recent years. It's a great field of endeavor that I like to look at. <clears throat> but the history of evolution and psychology, I won't go into it completely here, but um, uh, there's fitness theory and re reciprocity theory that have come about. And uh, we'll talk more about that, but uh, evolutionary psychologists, Lita Cosmides and John Tooby are two of the big uh, people in the field. <clears throat> and these are the theoretical tenets they put out. That the brain is a computer, as I, des as I mentioned, designed, it's got hardware in it to help us survive and reproduce. And the individuals in human behavior is, is generating uh, the, these evolved computer things to help us in that whole process. The cognitive programs are embedded, but they're not, 
the only things that we have. We have a lot of other software that goes, goes on as well. But I, I want to uh, spend time on this, this slide here. But I do want to point out, if you want to know about survival and uh, the fittest, Genghis Khan was one of the leaders because a half a percent of all the world's population has been descended from him because he had thousands of wives and concubines. There's three products of any evolutionary process. We get adaptations and hardwired in our brain. <clears throat> Things like murder, and, uh, tribal loyalty, sexual adaptations. But we also get byproducts like our navels and umbilical cords. We don't need those things, but they're byproducts of it. And there's some things that come out of evolution that are just noise. We don't have to worry about them. But how do we determine what things are true in evolutionary psychology? Here's some of the ways we do that. We find it if it's evident across all cultures. Remember I mentioned them, the 200 different things we see in all cultures, all times. Those are, those are a pretty damn good indicator of it. If we find it in the, uh, evident across all species, we know that bonobo chimpanzees, all chimpanzees, are very social. They take care of their young. They, they uh, go to war against uh, neighboring tribes, etc. <clears throat> and the, then there's the fitness consequences. Do we, does an adaptation, a behavior, have some fitness uh, 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 consequences. The, the fact that I take care of a child, uh, has compassion for a child, says that, that, that that's going to give fitness to that child to be able to survive and reproduce. And then evidence at the population level, we see that as well. But another one is um, um, group interactions as well. There's a parental investment theory. It's the idea that when we parent, it takes an enormous amount of resources away from our own survival and reproduction to do that. But a lot of that comes from uh, on the burden of women. And because there is a gender difference in the amount of uh, investment, women are choosier. And men, though, are more competitive at attracting young women. Uh, women have only a few eggs and times to be able to raise a child. And by the way, the, the amount of child has to, you have to raise a child, a human child, at least four years to survive. And there's a lot of studies on that. It's really interesting. Oh, they've let four-year-olds loose in the wild and they've survived? Or? Yeah, there's a great book called, I highly recommend, one of the great anthropology books by Robert or Richard Turnbull called The Mountain People. Talk about a transformative book. Wow. Read that. Uh, this is a society, a society, it was a whole, but because of a lot of environmental influences, it fell apart and the children are, are cast off and uh, um, uh, it, it's, it's frightening what happens. It's the land of the, the mountain of people, all right. Yeah. The Mountain People by Richard Turnbull, great book. He also wrote a book, The, the, the uh, Forest People, about the pygmies, just the opposite, where it's a loving, caring society. The people in the mountain people are ruthless with each other. I've heard that that mountain men are really rough and tough and. Yeah, but this is this is in Africa. Oh, okay. This is in Africa. Um, so we got a difference between the males and females. How they're going to go? Robert Chivers came up with what he calls the female selection theory. <clears throat> men are attracted to younger, more fertile women with clear complexion. Why clear complexion? Because you know what? If they, if you got pock marked smallpox on it, you want to stay away from that person. And interestingly enough, a 70 to 100 uh, hip to uh, waist ratio, because independent of body type, you could be a mesomorph or ectomorph, because that is the best for reproduction. But women are attracted to men of high status, rich, dependable, committed, and with good resources. But, but they're also attracted, as you know from history, uh, to, to hunks on the side. That's why men that are infertile, we always find that women can get pregnant. That's why we're here. But women need a committed, rich resource man. One of the great stories, by the way, on this, uh, it's used, is uh, Steffi Graf was a professional tennis player, and uh, she was making $40 million a year at the time. And when she was out on the court, somebody yelled to her, 
Steffi, marry me. And she yelled back, how much money do you have? It goes to show the subconscious, uh, you know, she certainly didn't need money, but, uh, you know, subconscious drive of women for a high status, uh, rich person. Mike, how, how does that play into the fact that in art and art history, we see different uh, male and female um, physiques depicted as being attractive or idealized, and those physiques change over time, you know, yes. from uh, what we would consider today obese well, to, uh, you know, to slender, tanned, not well, tanned, etc. You know, during the, uh, the Roko period, you know, of course, fat women were, <laughs> were very attractive because most women were skinny and couldn't bear children because they were protein deficient. Uh, uh, it, 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 uh, it bears different things at different times, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of who is going to be able to carry a baby better. Well, it sounds then that, that some sociological influences that change over time can affect our conceptions of a okay. desirable partner and beauty and whatnot. Exactly. Whatever. But most people feel that, that things like the hip to rate, waist ratio dependent upon uh, independent of the body type is, is important, but also clear complexion, so they, mm -hmm. they, they rosy cheeks, it shows that the person is healthy. Also symmetrical looking uh, faces has been, has been found, again, cross, these studies have been cross-culturally. People are attracted to symmetrical faces because there may be genetic problems uh, with unsymmetrical faces. But just remember this, I'll bring it back to this. Evolution gives us only two primal drives, survival and reproduction. Just remember, we are great apes at the end of a four billion year biological success story. And if you look at here, these are bonobo chimps. We see in the upper left there a picture that uh, the loving, caring aspects of, of uh, chimpanzee and us. We see the caring of children in the lower left. We see the tribal loyalty in the center one. And we also see the aggression, especially between uh, competitive males for male dominance. This is a list of some of the things that say psychologists believe that are hardwired into our brain. Aspects about infanticide, language, incest or incest taboo, intelligence, marriage patterns, promiscuity, perception of beauty, the bride price, parental investment, uh, altruism, morality, tribalism, racism, sexism, fear of snakes and uh, uh, spiders, uh, consciousness, violence, and the difference, what we're gonna find out later, actually hardwired into us between liberals and conservatives. Remember Harrison Ford? He was fearless, right? Except he said, snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Because that's the one thing he feared. And by the way, we don't have a fear, direct fear of snakes and spiders. It's the first introduction. For example, my granddaughter, when she came to our house and there was some caterpillars, I remember my wife Suzanne pulled out a caterpillar, put it on her hand, and my granddaughter was looking very intently. Is this a, a dangerous thing or not? And then after that, it was fine with it. But it's our first inclin inclination that we're trained in. But the hardwiring is there to instinctively fear snakes, spiders, dangerous things like that. This is an example we're going to talk about called the Westermark effect, about um, uh, the incest taboo. In the Israeli kibbutzes early on, they took the children away from their parents, put them in these communes of communal living. The children were all raised together. And they raised them this way because they thought eventually they would all fall in love, get married, have children, and stay in the kibbutz. As it turned out, it was just the opposite. It was rare that they ever had sex together where they grew up or married. The incest taboo is one of those that the incest Timothy tells us that don't marry someone of your own sibling. And when you're raised together, psychologically, they viewed all of those children in their kibbutz as, as, uh, as siblings. It's called the Westermark effect. 
Early on, <clears throat> there's quite a bit of evolution within evolutionary psychology of the thinking. Early on, uh, Michael Roos says, morality, or more strictly a belief in morality, is merely an adaptation to place our uh, to, uh, to put in place to further our reproductive ends. In an important sense, ethics, is, as we understand it, is an illusion fobbed on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. Pretty ruthless, huh? Here's a one even more ruthless. Michael Gislin posts, speaks of morality more coldly. No hint of genuine charity ameliorates our vision of society once sentimentalism has been laid aside. What passes for cooperation turns out to be a mixture of opportunism and exploitation. Sounds like so, uh, an, a fan of objectivism. Almost, yes. Well, so objectivists use this theory, but uh, I'll refute it here in a second. But scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. Now, that has changed as evolutionary psychology has evolved because we do know that, you know, from a lot of other studies now, okay. that altruism is embedded in our genes. And also, uh, David Sloan Wilson and E.O. Wilson believe in what's called group selection, that individuals survive better in their groups when, when, uh, they, when the groups do better. But that is very contested, by the way, within evolutionary psychology. I'm not going to get into it, but tribalism is one of the basic things that we're hardwired for. Sadly, um, you know, going to war with other tribes is just an ancient old thing. I love the, the ideas that some people have about this Rousseauian belief of, of the natural society where people get along and everything else. When studies have actually been done on hunter-gatherer society, societies, 30% of the adult males are killed through murder and violence. Yeah, 30%. Steven, Steven Pinker talks a lot about that in, uh, in his book, uh, Enlight uh, not Enlightenment Now, the one that preceded that, The Better Angels of Our yeah, Nature. Nature, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, we've got that instinct going on. Uh, and we see it throughout history, the battles, and I don't need to tell you that the tribalism is still going on today. Evolutionary uh, psychology now, though, gives several reasons for morality. One is kin selection. That's the selfish gene theory. I'm trying to protect my, my genes. And one famous biologist said, I'm willing to give up my life for two of my children or eight of my cousins. <laughs> now think about it. That's the amount of gene investment in each of those. But right? not nine of your cousins. That's yeah. just too much. That's asking too much. Right? <laughs> eight of your cousins. Uh, or uh, also it's called group, group collection, which I pointed out is controversial. There's reciprocal altruism. Scratching your back, I'll scratch mine. One of the great examples is vampire bats. Vampire bats, when they uh, go out to hunt, many times they're unsuccessful. They can't survive more than three to four days without a meal. So what the uh, other bats will do, if, if one is not successful, they will regurgitate some food for that one that was unsuccessful because maybe in a couple days, they're gonna be unsuccessful. And that way, the group survives. So it's reciprocal altruism, scratching the back of the other people in your tribe. Then there's also reputational trust. Uh, altruism is rewarded for those people who share the most. And of course, this, we see this especially with leaders uh, in a group, in a group situation. Of course, we are have hierarchical societies. And um, the chicken in every pot that every uh, politician has to proclaim is one way of getting reputational trust. Well, it's also true that freeloaders and cheaters sometimes in a society of, of altruists and um, reciprocal altruism, freeloaders and cheaters can rise to the top so that, so I've seen that there's a, um, some, some uh, scientists have talked about striking a balance between cheaters and individualists versus collectivism, and that if you don't get that balance right, the society exactly, falls apart. Exactly, right? Scott, because, and we're gonna be talking about this in a second, because that's exactly what happened. We got a push-pull going on. But just remember also, uh, morality is nature's way of getting us to get along in small tribes. If you're out on an African savanna in a small tribe, and one of the members cheats 
or lies or steals or gets violent and murders somebody, you're kicked out of the tribe. Guess what? You're not going to survive. You have very little chance to survive out there with all the predators out there alone. So it's nature's way of getting us to get along. Uh, a good book just to recommend, it's an early book, but it's still pretty good, Robert Wright's book, The Moral Animal Explains Evolutionary Theory. If you want to see that, understand it's early and it's, it's got a lot, a lot more changes, but it's very well written and well researched. But here's a big question for all of us. How much of our behavior, indeed our morality, is determined by our subconscious psychology? That's a big question for us. Most scientists now believe that we are biopsychosocial creatures that are all intertwined, those factors all intertwined and impossible to tease apart. We try the best we can, but it's all mixed up in there. We're not any one of those. Jonathan Haidt uh, started off, and his name is H-A-I-G-H-T, but it's pronounced Haidt, uh, the I. Uh, he was at the University of Virginia. He's bounced around several universities since. But he came up with the, I, the concept of moral foundations, that we have six basic moral foundations. Care and harm. This is the one where we're going to care for our vulnerable children, try and raise them up better. Uh, fairness and cheating, just what you were talking about. We don't like free riders. Uh, and in our society, and we don't like them. You know, if you're in an African tribe out in the savanna, and there's a, somebody ain't cutting it, cutting it uh, for the rest of the group, uh, you know, that, is, that they're going to hear about it. Loyalty betrayal. You better be loyal to your tribe. I, I, I joke that down there, and I mentioned it to somebody here, that down in the South, um, you're either real liberal or real conservative. There's nothing in between. And the good old boys down there, they may have a gay sister or brother, but they're never going to support the gay issues because they're going to, that would be disloyal to the tribe of being the tribe of good old boy. Authority subversion. This, uh, we may not like it, but it's fact that societies arrange hierarchically and uh, usually with an authoritarian leader. But again, to oppose that and be a countervailing point is liberty oppression, where we get upset if people are too bullying and too oppressive to us, uh, too much of a strong leader. So it keeps those bullies in line. And then lastly, sanctity degradation. This is because uh, we fear foods or uh, animals, etc., that can be harmful to us. Rotting meat immediately sends off uh, a signal in our brain, don't eat this. Certain smells, etc. we're hardwired for that, like the snakes and the, the spiders. So all of those six things come about, but what's interesting is that there literally is a difference between liberals and conservatives. We all have these moral foundations. It's the percentage amount on these. And by the way, these studies have been done worldwide with a number of cultures, including hunter-gatherer societies like the Kung of, of the Kalhari, and that liberals are very much concerned about harmless, harm, about fairness, about liberty, where conservatives are much more interested in, this, in, tri in the, being in-group, the tribalism, being a, all having an authority figure, and also the purity. There's many people believe that, that because of this, and we see this in all these different societies, that, the, um, that this is why conservatives are very much more interested in, in defense against homosexuality uh, and looking for authoritarian figures. Do I need to tell you about Trump? Uh, but again, we're all influenced by these things. It's the percentage uh, different people may be in all of these different societies. It's always imposing its will on us. And actually, uh, some studies have been done. The amygdala is the area where the fight or flight uh, adaptation takes place. You can tell if someone's going to be liberal or conservative with an 86% chance of, of success by just measuring the size of the amygdala because conservatives are much more fear-bound, fear-recognizing. There's a lot of interesting studies along those lines. Morality, <clears throat> Jonathan Haidt said, 
Morality binds people into groups. It gives us tribalism, it gives us genocide, war, and politics, but it also gives us heroism, altruism, and sainthood. It's giving all of these factors imposed upon us. Daniel Kahneman was a, a, a psychologist in the Israeli military. He was supposed to figure out who is going to be the best leaders, etc. he and his partner. And he thought, oh, I can figure that out. It turns out they were entirely wrong with everybody they picked. The people that were real meek and everything ended up being the generals of the Israeli army. But unlike a lot of people who would be defensive about it, he said, you know what? We just realized we snookered ourselves. And he realized that there's he and his partner came up with the concept of fast thinking and slow thinking. Fast thinking is the instinctual, this is out of the old brain thinking, but it many times can be helpful to us. If you're running from a lion, you don't have time to take time to think about it, you're gonna run and climb the nearest tree. But then there's also slow thinking. It's flexible, it's slow mode, it's reflective, it's rational. You're using all your cognition, cognition on that. This is the name of his book, too, if I remember correctly. Great book. Yeah. Absolutely great. I highly recommend it. Thinking fast, thinking slow. <clears throat> Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for economics and never had an economics course. He was a psychologist. Why? He showed that all the, all the big thinkers are full, bull, uh, full of bull hockey. All you, when you go on CNBC and you see the people, oh, this is going to happen. Every Stock market managers can't beat the market 80% of the time, and long term can't beat the market 95% of the time. That's why ETFs became so popular. He basically showed that psychologists, all the economists, the so-called experts weren't. The book Moneyball and movie Moneyball were based upon Daniel Kahneman's theories. The guy that started that, the, the, the hero in that, he just used rational methods. Exact, for example, you didn't look at, uh, uh, look at the picture or anything. You just look at the statistics. How many times did a hitter get on base? How many times did a guy stop somebody from getting on base as a pitcher? And in Moneyball, it worked because there was baseball scouts out there that had 45 years experience and the guy would say, baseball scout, well I can spot a baseball pitcher in five minutes just watching him. You can't, your instincts are wrong. So that, that is one of the more interesting things that came out of Daniel Kahneman's work. All kinds of things came out of that. Addictions, I do work in addictions and right in this building here down in the basement, I started Smart Recovery. I was one of the founders of Smart Recovery. Um, it's been 31 years. I started in 1989. And at that time, uh, I introduced evolutionary psychology. I told by the experts, by the, I was told I was crazy and uh, that it was, you know, it was nuts. I was going to kill people with it. By the way, now today, all the major universities, that's what they're teaching, exactly what I was teaching about bringing evolutionary psychology into addictions. Keep this in mind with addictions. The reason we start using is different we keep using. We continue using because the monkey is on our back. We may start because of uh, depression or just party time or everything else. We keep using because our brains have changed and our brains have been hijacked. We literally think after we become addicted we'll die if we don't get our substance or behavior. That's why people do all the stupid shit they do. They give up their family, their friends, their livelihood, their self-esteem, everything. Because literally, subconsciously, they think they'll die if they don't get it. Remember, evolution gives us only two primal drives, survival and reproduction. Technically, these are only two things you really enjoy, serotonin and dopamine. Dopamine is considered to be the, the um, master chemical uh, molecule of addiction. It, it, uh, produces what's called a pleasure circuit in the brain. It's produced out of the ventral to the mental area that goes to the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure center. So we get this rush of feeling, it's so great. It also goes to the hippocampus where our memories are stored. Out of that whole area though, and the amygdala, um, we get this pleasure. But if you, uh, addictions like cocaine, for example, gives 500 times more dopamine response than eating a hamburger. So, this, so the brain says, oh, 
this is good, this feels good, but it's way too much. And because of homeostatic balance, we start clipping off dendrites. We also start clipping off dendrites in the prefrontal cortex, where the brain's uh, uh, management centers, our decision making is going on. So you got to push pull. You got the old brain saying, I need more and more and more of this stuff just to feel normal. And the old and the, the neocortex, the, the, the regulation portion of our brain, uh, is not operating properly. This is why, how addictions work. It's not because we're spiritually corrupt, uh, we have a terrible uh, personality, or whatever you want to call it. It's a predictable biological response, as I told somebody just today. I said, if we put enough heroin in your body for two or three weeks, I'll guarantee you, you'll do anything for a fix. I don't care what your personality is, what kind of good person you are. These, the, the standard sociological model is still out there and still being promoted by a lot of people so, all the time. Here's the APA guidelines. It's amazing to me. Traditional masculinity is marked by stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggression, and is on the whole harmful, and men are toxic because of the way they are socialized. Well, first of all, men are socialized mostly by women. But we see this effect coming about. The problem is not that we have it. It's what are we going to do with these inclinations? This is the, the dilemma for us. We have these. Uh, I find it interesting that people are so surprised by the Me Too movement. Uh, we all know for centuries that men's brains are in their pants, right? We don't need to be told that. We know that. It's what are we going to do about it? How are we going to tame these, these instincts that aren't useful for us anymore? That's the big question. And by the way, on this, what's amazing, they talk about stoicism being terrible. Stoicism is the basis for rational emotive behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, which have been proven over and over, the most proven techniques for uh, combating, um, recovering from uh, depression, anxiety, PTSD, addictions, and they're saying it's not good. I mean, this is beyond belief to me. But this is why this ideology gets in the way of the scientific theory, thinking. Again, how much of our thinking is because of just rearranging our prejudices? That how much of it is impinging on? I'm always looking at people, society, and, and thinking, you know, when I see people uh, arguing out on the Senate floor, well, you know, they're really just animals in loincloths, the naked apes in loincloths, fighting with each other for competition. Uh, male competition with each other. And of course, we see the evolution of man. And here's another version. Uh, I'll end it there. We'll ask any, answer any questions people have. <clears throat> I do have my email address there. This uh, PowerPoint is available. I have a book on uh, humanism. Uh, that's uh, available on uh, 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 Amazon. Uh, uh, it's called um, uh, What Can You Believe If You Don't Believe in God? I also have a book on uh, uh, the history of uh, humanism within the Unitarian Universalist Association and as a critique as well. And it's called uh, 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 Regaining Balance. Pardon me, I'm thinking about too many different things here. I'm trying to think of everything I got to think about at the end here. I want to thank everybody here, but I'll answer any questions that people have. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, you know, typical of many of our Science Sunday talks, uh, very dense with information, and uh, we love it. It's like a fire hose. Well, that's why I got the PowerPoint people could go back and review it, because it is a fire hose. Yeah. But there's so much, and you can learn so much about what life is, who we are as human beings. The, uh, one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking about evolution selecting for just two things, um, you know, survival and reproduction, how does something like self-actualization, you know, the fact that self-esteem, self-actualization, whether it's artistic expression or, or other things that seem to be a fundamental need of people and people who don't have opportunities for that um, 
get uh, get mentally uh, constrained and perhaps mentally ill. So how does how do those kinds of well, higher things fit in? Uh, Daniel Dennett <clears throat> is a mm -hmm. evolutionary psychologist philosopher, a wonderful guy who died a few years ago. You want to talk into the mic a little more? Uh, so but he uh, but Daniel Dennett um, uh, points out that so much of our needs for beauty, etc., really come back to evolution. Uh, if you can sing a song, if you can draw a painting, if you can uh, uh, do a drama, etc., mm -hmm. uh, it entices people to be, um, especially if you're a male, you may get more uh, reproductive rewards from that. That's one of the general theories. I think also uh, there's, um, they call just so stories. Some of that might be just a just so story. Mm -hmm. It sounds good, but it may not be true. But also as a result, a secondary result, it's what Stephen J. Cole calls a spandrel uh, on a Gothic church. Of um, uh, it, it, It's a, a result of uh, evolution uh, coming about, but it's not the actual thing. It's a result of consciousness. Right. Once we reach certain levels of consciousness, we're going to see this. Uh, our brain may be too big, and we want something higher. We want elevation. We all, we all want something that is more meaningful, powerful in our lives. I believe Steven Pinker and even uh, Richard Dawkins have talked about how modern psychological and sociological constructs have leveraged these sort of foundational capabilities and capacities that evolution has provided us with and provided a basis for us to take hold of those with our more sophisticated, our slow thinking, our more deliberative thinking so that we can, for example, expand our notion of what a tribe is, right? The, no the notion that, you know, I'm an American. Well, this notion that you are somehow related to or invested in the well-being of people that you've hundreds of millions of people that you've never met is potentially just leveraging or ratcheting up this innate tendency we have for kin selection. So evolution has provided a foundation, but we are eminently capable, and in fact in many cases have, built upon that foundation with higher level uh, cognition and um, uh, constructs that we've made. And that really is what civilization is about. Mm -hmm. is overcoming a lot of these baser tendencies uh, or tribalism, etc. And in, as a humanist, I look at it as uh, enlarging our circles of compassion. Right. Uh, and we certainly don't have that today in our, in our very uh, broken society we have today. Uh, nobody wants to en enlarge their circles of compassion, it seems. Well, I'm not sure it's fair to say nobody. But well, no, that's not, <laughs> not nobody. But, but it's not it's, as prevalent as we'd like. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Thank you. Well, any I don't. Questions? Or? I don't see any additional questions online. Uh, I was, I was Mike has got a question. You want to it, so yeah, I will. But happiness, and I think humanists are interested in human flourishing, the flourishing of people, and, and uh, <clears throat> it seems like a challenge of how we fit into a world uh, that doesn't seem to provide for happiness at the level of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we, let me repeat the question. So we've got um, one of our audience members, uh, Mike Winter. Some of you may know him. Uh, he said that you know one of the one of the ideals that we have, especially as humanists, is the notion of human flourishing and human happiness. And how does that comport with providing opportunities for that, or constraining opportunities with that? And is is human um, facilitating a, a social structure where human happiness is prioritized. Is that part of anything in evolutionary psychology? Is that a fair yeah. way to say your question? And it really goes, I think, goes back to um, actually Aristotle who came up with uh, eudynomia, the word the eudynomia was originally des described as happiness. Modern translations describe it as, as flourishing, as you mentioned. We don't want just happiness. Uh, we, in the matrix, we see the, the protagonist having to choose between the red pill and the blue pill. He can have pure happiness, etc., but also he can have authenticity. Somehow, human beings 
we want authenticity more than anything else. And that's different than other animals, do you think? I, I think that is. I think yeah. it's a, a consciously evolved thing. And it really also stems out of Maslow's work, who is a, a humanist of the year. Maslow said that if you need hierarchy, we got to fill all those natural basic functions of survival and reproduction, of safety and, right. and food and shelter. And then we need the safety, and then higher up, we need emotional support. As but if, well. you, if you have food and safety and you don't have emotional support, you can't you rise do. up to those right. levels. And, and, and it's, it's a negative, right? It, it's, uh, it, it, makes, it, it sets the stage for depression. Right. and lack of self-confidence and all kinds of exactly. other negative and things. That's why we can't raise up to the factors where we're also then starting to move out of our ego selves into, uh, you know, uh, where we can uh, freely uh, entertain the most important things of our lives, the deepest things that, that are more meaningful to us. Uh, but that takes um, uh, a lot of support underneath there. You know, you, it, the addiction work I do, you know, People are acting down on the very survival letter level. They don't, can't think about all the other stuff. And by the way, so Smart Recovery Now, it's now on six continents. Uh, 29 countries have evolved, are using it. 25 have uh, got our members manual uh, translated, including ancient Australian Aborigine. We were in... Uh, 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 Denmark last year, and in Copenhagen, there's 40 smart recovery groups. It started right here, folks, in the basement, right in this building right here. Fantastic. And uh, uh, the federal prisons are all in smart recovery. All of the um, prisons now in California, it, Texas. It's a secular and scientific it alternative. It uses anything to, scientific that works. Primarily to, uh, cognitive I'll, behavioral, behavioral, uh, and rational motor behavioral as uh, uh, therapy as applied to addictions. Right. People, one time were telling me I was going to kill people with it. Now it's the standard being used. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, one f final question that occurred to me while you were talking about human sexuality. Um, what about outliers, uh, whether you're dealing with um, uh, common outliers like homosexuality or rarer um, uh, uh, manifestations of human sexuality like uh, transgender issues or uh, sexual identity issues and whatnot. How, how does that comport with some of the research that, that you've that seen? That is really a fascinating area. I, I keep tabs with it loosely, but um, the research is totally unsettled. There's a lot of different theories about okay. uh, that from Kim's kin selection, if you have a gay uncle, they're protecting that child and therefore their genes are getting passed down as well. And we see this in many societies group societies where the aunts and uncles are like my own father. He was raised by his mm -hmm. aunt. Um, well, so I'm specifically, that's one of the theories, but I will say this. To me, it's totally unsettled. I was talking about specifically the, the idea that we have a genetic uh, imprint, you know, uh, an X and Y chromosome versus uh, XX chromosome, male versus female, but that doesn't necessarily comport with everybody's identity oh, no, there's, so, there's, there's there's uh, there's a great thing on youtube you can get on the, the different types mm -hmm. of uh the biological difference i think they they probably put out 50 different types of uh, different biological differences so to me it's, it's if you can imagine it it's happening right. <laughs> and evolution allows all kinds that's, of experimentation that's right, right. Yeah. exactly and that's that, that that's why you know we get caught in these fixed categories in there it's ridiculous. Right. Nature, nature doesn't care about right. these categories. All right. Thanks, Mike. This, uh, I think we're out of time, but this has been really wonderful. It's been great to have you visit, and uh, hopefully you come back again. It's uh, great and, to be uh, here. Uh, continue your good work with your humanist group in, is it North Carolina? Uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Right. And uh, do you have a YouTube channel or something? Where no, you... um, I don't have that. Okay. <laughs> But you've got books, so I, I got books. You can go on Amazon books. and get the books. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks so much.